Okay, so let me take you on a whirlwind study of what I've been working on in the last little while. The synchronic study of language change and progress is one of the key contributions of variation of sociolinguistics. This area has been an evolving enterprise for nearly 50 years. The research covers a broad range of communities, data types, and innumerable linguistic features. The building evidence supports principles of linguistic change. As enunciated by Labov most extensively in his three volumes from Labov 1994, 2001, and 2010, and ongoing studies attest to the broad applicability of these principles. Of course, that's within the variationist paradigm. The aim of this workshop is to explore links between sociolinguistics and syntax. So let's first consider a bit of backstory on the rapprochement between the two fields. Well, there are definitely two lively traditions, but for the most part, they operate relatively isolated from each other with English historical syntax being an exception. In the uh, 1990s, syntacticians and variationist researchers were considered strange bedfellows. Some attempts to unify them came about <laughs> through Quinn's work on reconciliation and Meachin and Foley in 19, uh, 1994 in their paper entitled Building Bridges. By the 2001s, more syntacticians and variationist researchers were getting together. For example, the uh, volume by Cornets and Corrigan in 2005 really set the stage and uh, David Adger and Jennifer Smith got together in 2005 and did quite a bit of work together as did Adger and Truesdell a little bit later on. An important question that arises, however, and I have been grappling with this of late, is how to identify syntactic change. There is very little consideration of syntax in historical grammars. Some historically oriented works that treat syntax, but these are largely descriptive and confined to the interaction of morphology and syntax. Typologists have tried to explain uh, syntactic change, but mostly these are attempts to motivate syntactic change in the interest of typological consistency. Well, you're lucky in Europe because many uh, European languages, you can see word order changes. We heard about some earlier today and it just so happens they happened in recorded history or even contemporary varieties. You can see these types of change easily in the shift from object verb to verb object or genitive noun to noun genitive. But as Longobardi pointed out in 2003, this type of change had multiple causes and doesn't represent a single shift in linguistic structure. Most of the time, syntactic structures and operations are not visible in phonemes and morphemes because only the surface strings are visible. Also, there are many gaps and limitations in the historical documentary record, as well as variation due to sociolinguistic factors. As Kroc points, uh, 2001 points out, conclusive results have been hard to come by. Another difficulty is that syntactic change unfolds slowly, sometimes over hundreds of years. It proceeds below consciousness and only a small number of alleged syntactic changes are stigmatized. The infamous like, for example, and the use or overuse of adverbs like hopefully and like. Moreover, changes that are gradually transforming grammar are unremarked and typically invisible to anecdotal scrutiny, such as the rise of the progressive from the kettle boils to the kettle is boiling. Moreover, the oldest audio materials from synchronic studies are from the late 1800s. The evidence in this type of material is often scant and critically, it's formal or elevated in style even when in recent times we have the records of radio and television, the register is relatively highbrow. And as we'll see, this has a major bearing on the nature of the data. Further, spoken data, either from sociolinguistic interviews or oral histories are mostly from the 20th century. So the time depth is woefully shallow. 
Another issue is that variation of sociolinguistics and syntactic theory have highly contrastive goals. Variationists want to explain why there are eternal alternatives in the, in the language. They look for condition patterning, paradigmatic trends like regularization. They focus on regional dialect differences and the impact of language contact, among other things. If there are two different forms that, means, that mean the same thing in discourse, what's the explanation? Syntacticians, on the other hand, are looking for explanation. What's the structure? How to draw the tree? What's the role of each element in the derivation? Is it movement or merging of constituents? And if there are two different forms, there must be two different structures. All that being said, I do believe that very large corpora representing as long a trajectory in time as we have available can be useful. Let me introduce you now to two corpora of vernacular speech. The first is the British dialects data that I and my students collected when I was at the University of York in England. The archive represents eight communities from my own research and several others, which I've worked on in collaboration with Jennifer Smith at the University of Glasgow. The data come from informal conversations and oral histories from people born and raised in these communities. The second repository of vernacular speech is what I've been working on since coming back to Canada. It's the Ontario Dialects Project. This is a long-term documentation project comprising samples from 20 small towns and counting. The location is the broad expanse of Ontario, Canada. These data represent about 11 million words collected through on the ground fieldwork and lengthy recordings of people born and raised in these places. The transcription enterprise alone is extremely time consuming and continues in my lab all the time. For those of you in Europe, I wanted to give you an idea of the geographic coverage I'm talking about. On the left of the slide here is Ontario, which you see outlined in red. And the yellow circle at the bottom is the city of Toronto, where I'm here, uh, where I am now. And on the right is the province of Ontario superimposed on the UK and Europe, outlined in pink and dark purple. So the geographic area of Ontario goes from the far north of Scotland right down to Switzerland. So can sociolinguistic data of this type be useful for syntax? Well, it's vernacular, it's spoken and it's interactive. I have to say it is messy. Sometimes there are more than one person in the interviews, they talk over each other and sometimes the sound quality is really bad. The data aren't balanced as in corpus linguistics where there's a plan and a cutoff point. So the number of words by category is equal. That's not the case with sociolinguistic data. Another thing is that it's unpredictable. You never know what someone is gonna tell you or for how long or what amazing words and expressions may come out of their mouth or not. Finally, sociolinguistic data is cross-cut by innumerable social factors. The date of birth of the speakers, where they were born, how old they are, their education, their job type, whether they're bilingual or not, and any number of other factors. Longombardi notes that in order to study syntactic change in corpora, we need to know what to compare. It's easy enough to spot differences in phonemes and phonology or morphemes and morphology, but what about syntax? At this point, I'm gonna to turn to take you on a brief tour through a few syntactic -y features. And I say syntactic -y because they are reported to be syntactic features. Some people would think they are syntactic features, but I know enough syntacticians to know that many of them would say they are not. Let's first begin with plural existential constructions. They've been studied in a vast literature in both syntax and variation. Many analyses in syntax attempt to explain the alternation between agreement morphology and non-agreement. Analyses and variation do the same thing, but as I mentioned, 
focus on the patterns of surface variability in the case of plural expansions, where both plural and singular agreement is possible, like this. Here you see uh, Lauren, uh, Lawrence Warren, age 86, and in one case he says there is always a few where the noun is singular, and in another sentence right after he says there are a few where the, uh, where the verb is plural. This variation is ubiquitous in spoken vernacular. Alternation between singular and plural verb forms is robust. As you see here in the alternation of past tense be, sometimes the speaker uses a plural form were, sometimes the speaker uses singular was, but in each case, the noun is plural. The other cool thing is this alternation has been going on for hundreds of years in the English language. So here are a couple of examples, one from 1400 and one from 1533. And the variation happens just about everywhere where sociolinguistic corpora have been collected, in the Southern United States, in Sydney, Australia, in York and England, and in Nova Scotia in Canada among many other places attested in the literature. So back in 1998, when I was in York in England, I used the York English corpus to analyze the alternation between was and were in plural existential constructions. It was strongly conditioned by polarity, the difference being affirmative and negative, with a notable shift in usage. In affirmatives, was is the preferred choice, the green bar. And in negatives, weren't is the preferred choice, the blue bar. Another key conditioning factor was the type of determiner. You can see here that was, the green bars, is the preferred choice in the context of numeric quantifiers, the negative quantifier, no, other quantifiers and partitives. Whereas noun phrases, simple noun phrases like there were cats, have more were. And yet across the board, you see more was than were in the cases of there was two cats, no cats, some cats. I then turned to look at this in each of the communities we studied in, in Britain. And when I expanded my study to these dialects, I discovered that the preference for weren't in negatives, but was in affirmatives tended to be the preferred contrast in most places, as you see here. However, it wasn't universal. It could also go the other way around with more was uh, in positive, uh, in affirmatives than negatives. Nevertheless, the overarching finding was that polarity was a defining contrast across the board. So to summarize across these studies, two key linguistic contrasts dominated, polarity and the nature, it says my, system has run out of memory, so I hope this will continue to work. And the nature of the determiner phrase, where the non-standard form was appears more often when the construction is affirmative, not negative. And when the determiner phrase contained a negative quantifier, a number, a numeric quantifier, or a part of it. A key finding was also the extent of the consistency of the two internal patterns, the negative affirmative contrast and the NP type hierarchy, suggesting an underlying structural explanation. Let me turn now to a set of key linguistic features of interest in English that have been studied extensively mostly in historical written documents, and in all cases considered to be syntactic variables. The genitive, 
subject relative pronouns, ditransitives, and comparatives. So in the genitive, there's a choice between s and of. In subject relative pronouns, who, zero, and that. In ditransitives, you can have an NP, NP construction, or in comparatives, you get a wide, uh, a two forms, either the ER or the more wide construction. George, can you give me a sense of whether you're actually seeing this? Because I keep getting a signal that there's something wrong with my system. So I can see the slides just fine. Excellent, thank you. I feel more confident. Okay, so in the early 2010s, my colleague Alexandra Darcy and I had completed studies of each of these features in the vernacular spoken data I just told you about. We started noticing something in our results that no one had made a big deal about before. What looked like variation, indeed complex multi-level variation, actually wasn't nearly as variable as we thought or that anyone had ever reported before. And this is uh, where I'm gonna show you what I mean. The choice between S and of in English genitives is heavily partitioned when you split the data by animacy, as you can see here. Animates are overwhelming S, the black bar, as in my daughter's toys, whereas inanimates take of the white bars, as in the name of the school. Variation in vernacular speech is actually quite rare, as you can see in the purple box. In the next slide, you see something a bit different. These are the comparatives. In one syllable adjectives, you get ER nearly all of the time, the black bars, right there. And in three syllable adjectives, nearly all the time, you get analytic more in the green box, like more in, a more interesting life. Of the 52 two-syllable adjectives that are in the data, only these actually alternate. And that is where the variation is, right there. I'll now turn to the datives. This is rather complicated, so I'm gonna go slow. Double object datives, the black bars, occur virtually categorically in the constructions with a nominal theme and a pronominal recipient, as in, give her a coffee. And yet, prepositional datives occur nearly categorically with pronominal themes, regardless of recipient type, as in, give it to her or give a coffee to her. See, what's really interesting is that the locus of variation is only with noun noun contexts where you get near equal variation between the two forms give the man a coffee or give a coffee to the man so the domain where variation is possible is once again highly restricted and within that restrictive set of inanimate themes, regardless of recipient type, occur more often with double object instructions, the black bars. Finally, let's look at the subject relatives. Here you can see there is only variation in animate contexts. Once again, you see a fundamental systemic divide in the vernacular grammar and relatively rare pockets of variation that are highly circumscribed, at least once you get the division right. Recall too that all the results you've just seen come from hundreds and sometimes thousands of examples from vernacular speech data in my archives. It exposes the shocking difference between what is reported in the literature for written documents and what we see here in vernacular usage. The final study that I wanna tell you about is one that has involved three researchers, myself, Heather Burnett, and Hilda Koopman. These are the negatives and polarity indefinites. 
which alternate in negative expressions in English with two variants, I know nothing and I don't know anything. In the data, these alternates occur with near equal frequency, as you can see here, negative quantifiers, 603, NPIs, 553. So what conditions the variation? Many studies report that construction type is the defining feature with more frequent constructions occurring more with negative quantifiers. Earlier studies on written materials and on synchronic spoken data showed that there was actually a hierarchy of constructions such that existential B had the most use of negative quantifiers, then state of have, then copula B, and finally lexical verbs occurred with the least negative quantifiers. You can see this construction hierarchy here. Oops. Modern written English, the hierarchy goes existential B, copula B, have lexical verbs. And this is replicated more or less in the same way across the board for modern written, modern spoken, and even Toronto in, 2000, in the 2000s. But not precisely the same hierarchy was found across studies. So in the paper, we argued that a frequency-based explanation needs additional interpretation. Recently, a number of researchers have been noticing something that was very critical to our analysis. Grammaticality contrasts may vary across languages. Something that is grammatical and categorical in one language may be optional or variable in another language. The fixed grammatical contrasts are referred to as hard contrasts, while the ones that vary are referred to as soft contrasts. So our question was this, if hard versus soft is a workable hypothesis, then an important question is to what extent do the apparently variable English patterns have correspondences with invariant syntactic patterns in other languages? In other words, what underlies the linear order? To do that, it's necessary to scrutinize languages related to English, for example, Scandinavian languages. Based on a very complex analysis by Kane, which required having a syntactician on board in the study, we argued that optional raising of the object is involved, making a key syntactic contrast between negative quantifiers and NPIs, depending on the nature of the structure. The prediction is that when there could have been object movement up, we will find more negative quantifiers. And sure enough, once the data were coded according to these syntactic levels, we found a partition system. Where the negative was higher than VP, it appeared as a negative quantifier. Those that were lower than VP appeared as NPIs, mostly, with a small amount of variation right here. The key finding in this study was that when the data are coded according to syntactic domain, rather than what had previously been done, which was by construction type, the variants are nearly completely distributed according to syntactic position. No appears in the higher syntactic domain about 95% of the time, any appears in the lower syntactic domain 95% of the time. And once again, the variation is very circumscribed. So, what does this tell us? The key observation, I think, is that when you carefully scrutinize certain syntactic alternates, you find that much of what appears to be variable on the surface is in fact mostly partitioned by well-known formal distinctions, animacy, syllable structure, structural hierarchies, and the like. So this finding adds support to the idea that what are hard contrasts in one language or, or dialect seem to be soft or variable in another. Another key observation arises from the studies we did in spoken language, 
that did not produce the same variation as had been reported for written language. So register style and other outside influences seem to increase variation in writing, but the vernacular is surprisingly regular. Finally, it appears that the locus of actual variation in vernacular spoken language, at least for these alternates, is pretty restrictive. However, we can now probe these areas of variation more carefully to understand where the softness lies. Is there syntactic variation? Of course, syntacticians would well, argue that that's not variation in underlying syntax. And what looks like variation is always going to be reducible to lexical and phonological variation, meaning differences or formal distinctions. But then what accounts for the areas where the variation actually is? And we can, there are many examples of that you just saw in those small circumscribed areas. For example, give me a coffee, give a coffee to me and the others that you see here. Where is variation in the grammar? Well, it's been explained by others in the literature as being the result of lexical and vocabulary featural choices, uh, key typological contrasts like the accessibility hierarchy, cognitive differences which offer processing advantages, and information structure. The problem is that not all syntactic analyses are equally amenable to one or the other of these types of explanations. The main thing, as my colleague Diane Massam said in 2015, is you, you've got to understand the formal details that underlie the variation. Only then can we get close at what explains it. So I believe that collaboration is the key. Sociolinguists with large inventories of linguistic features and phenomena have the methods and statistical techniques to eke out patterns of variation and isolate the locus of contrast and variation, whereas syntacticians with extensive formal training have the ability to evaluate the underlying structure of constructions and assess which one best works for the data. Although it's kind of sad, uh, at least for me, that English is not undergoing significant word order adjustments during our current time frame. There are still many other phenomena of interest in my materials. As you heard from Laura Rupp earlier, we see receding older features everywhere, zero articles, double demonstratives, and a whole slew of clause markers like yet, thus, for, to, and others. At the same time, new features are developing there's a veritable renaissance of new discourse pragmatic develops, developments uh, in things like, like, so yeah, wait, et cetera. And of course, we have to focus too on language contact, which is now transcending geography. I think the way forward, if uh, anything, is that these materials can enhance the empirical basis for syntactic theory, the possibility for integrating dialect grammars into larger theoretical frameworks as dialects disappear and they are disappearing fast. We also find a renaissance of new written registers in our midst, which as I suggested with the difference between written and spoken vernaculars, we should be able to probe that, that contrast between how variation exists in written versus spoken material. So thank you very much to everyone and your patience through my uh, difficulties. Uh, all of this research was supported by the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council of Canada. And Diane Masson has given me a lot of inspiration and support from syntax. And ongoing research collaborations continue. And I will end there.